until you become thoughtful, life can never be colorful. Life can never be colorful until somebody becomes thoughtful. Life can never be meaningful until somebody becomes thoughtful. This person that I am calling my friend now, what is he adding to me? What am I adding to her? Nothing. There's no reason for the friendship. This thing I am spending my time doing now, how has it profited me? No way. Then there is no need. Somebody say a loud amen. amen. So, that is existence with the strength of thought. Number two, mental strength equals quality decision making. Quality decision making. You need to be a boy, you need to be a girl, you need to be a man, you need to be a woman that is given to quality decision making. Truth is, the quality of your decision determines the quality of your destiny. Truth is, the decisions of yesterday are responsible for your destination of today. And the decisions of today will be responsible for your destination of tomorrow. The meaning is, what you, how you thought yesterday was responsible for where you are now. How you are thinking now will be responsible for where you will be tomorrow. How you are thinking now. When I was a growing up young man, I made quality decisions. Quality decisions. One of my quality decisions was, I will have a marriage that will be enviable. I won't see what my children saw. Uh, my children won't see what I saw. My wife won't see what my mother saw. Quality decisions. And where we are, maritally, didn't happen by accident. Quality decision. I saw standard role model marriages between T.L. Osborne and Daisy Osborne, between Kenneth Copeland, Gloria Copeland, between Charles and Francis Hunter then. And I saw these role models. I didn't know, know so much about Papa Yedeko at that time in terms of his marital testimony. And, and I saw these role models. And I made up my mind that this is where I will be. The strength of your thought. It determines the strength of your destiny. Is God speaking to anybody here at all? I made up my mind that I wasn't going to do normal church work. I wasn't struggling with whatever I was doing. So I can't be struggling in this one. Quality decision. When people are not thoughtful. Life can never be fruitful. And the truth of the matter is thoughtlessness equals aimlessness. So you make decisions of quality. Decisions of quality. I am one of those who believe that you don't, people don't get, necessarily get what they deserve in life. People get what they demand. The strength, the mental strength is quality decision making and, and this is what it means. Quality decision making is choosing the profitable above the comfortable. Something may be comfortable but not profitable. Something may be legitimate but not profitable. That is, if you eat too much food, they won't send you to prison. It's legal. But is it profitable? Nobody will be sentenced to prison for sleeping for 12 hours in a day. But where will you end with such a sleep? Choosing the profitable above just the comfortable. Oh, it is comfortable like this, but it will not be profitable in the end. So let me move beyond this level. Quality decision making. 
Before this conference is over, please ensure that you make nothing less than five to seven quality decisions. What your life, what is allowable in your life and what is abominable. Did you hear what I said? What is allowable and what is abominable? What can be what it, what is what can be celebrated and what you will, cannot be tolerated? You determine them. It's the strength of your thought. When you are a thoughtful person, to the ordinary person, you are too serious-minded. Am I communicating? And when people begin to say you are too serious, congratulations, you have started. Because until you are serious, life cannot be glorious. You never see anybody end in a glorious place without a serious mind. Take, take things easy. Calm down. No. It's too serious. It is that seriousness that has helped some of us to arrive at this level of gloriousness. And we are still on the journey. Quality decisions. And in quality decisions, you determine your priorities and you also determine your posteriorities. Any medical student around here? None? That would be a challenge. <laughs> you are a medical student where? Huh? Huh? Medical lab, okay. Medicine and surgery. Huh? Where are you studying? Huh? Belgium. Okay, general medicine is your own doesn't have surgery inside. What class are you now? First year, okay. You have what what of you? Nursing. Okay. You will know what I'm about to talk about. Yes? Any other person? Medical? Eh? What class? Oh, first year. Okay, you are not in anatomy yet. All right. So, if I, what is anterior? What of posterior? What of superior? What of inferior? Excellent. I think everybody knows that. Okay, so you, you have anterior relations, posterior relations, and then inferior and superior relations, superior and inferior relations of, we can tell you to tell, tell the anterior relations of a nerve or the posterior relations of the ulnar nerve, the cranial, and, and so on. So when I say priorities and posteriorities, what do I mean? That's right. You must be able to identify the things to keep in front of your life and the things to put behind you forever. Am I communicating? You must understand. That is, there are habits to put behind you forever. There are relationships to put behind forever. Not that those people became your enemies. But it means that those people cannot speak into your life. It means that those people don't have any counsel for you. Life is a product of transactions. For anything you want to gain, there is something you have to give. <laughs> Hello? For everything you want to gain, there is something you will have to give. For example, I want to gain medical, tra medical training. Then I have to give a lot of hours of study. Is that true or false? I give a lot of hours of study. Give a lot of aimless socializations. I want to gain salary at the end of the month. I had to give some hours of work and energy. It's eight hours a day, Monday to Friday, and then I will get something. This is the most important thing. This is what wisdom says. Ensure 
that what you are giving is not higher than what you are getting. In the transactions of life, ensure that what it is costing you is not heavier than what it is paying you. Hello? Yesterday I talked about selling a garden to get a gran get granite. Take your sin. Just ensure that. That was the tragedy of Esau. That he gave his birthright to get a plate of porridge. What he gave was heavier than what he gained. Ordinary food of one moment. That food will you cure your hunger forever. Food that can cure hunger for one moment. You gave some. You gave away your future to to handle the moment. You gave an irrecoverable asset to just tackle a, a temporary challenge. That is what mental strength is all about. Take your seat. It is quality decision making that is weighing profitables against just comfortable things. That is understanding what am I gaining versus what is it costing me. Somebody say amen. amen. And finally, mental strength equals high capacity to draw insight from the uni from the to draw insight from the university of the universe. The capacity, high capacity to draw insight from the university of the universe. <laughs> That's mental strength. Knowing that the universe is a university. Concerning David, Solomon, the Bible said he spake of everything, he spake of trees. From the high sub that come out of, springeth out of the wall to the cedar trees. Solomon spake about everything. The meaning of that is everything around you is teaching you something. Everything around you is saying something. In Jeremiah chapter 18, God spoke to Jeremiah, I think from verse 4 or 5, to go to the house of the potter. And he said, there I will curse you. Okay, start from verse 2. Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will curse you to hear my word. And I went to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a walk on the wheels. And the vessel was that the that he made of clay was mad in the hand of the potter. So he made it again, another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. That is, there is something I want to say, but when you are looking at the potter, as he's molding the pot, I will be saying something. So everything is saying something. The challenge is no people are not see, hearing anything. Many people have eyes that couldn't see nothing. They have ears that heard nothing. Take your seat. I am permanently with a pen and a paper. Permanently. Anytime you catch me, there are two things you will never catch me without. You won't catch me without a Bible. Whether it's in the hard copy form. Every phone I have has, has a Bible in it, both the audio Bible and the anything, and then the raw Bible. Then you will never catch me without a pen and a paper. Because I don't want to miss the lessons of life. 
and I don't want to miss the instructions from the university of the universe. One day I was standing, I was rushing, going to law school. I had a preaching engagement at the law school. In Buari. This will be almost 10 years ago. At the Riawan Junction. All the vehicles were ru rushing and I think no, no traffic warning was there. Everybody rushed and then arrived at the center of the road. The vehicles from here, vehicles from there, vehicles from there, vehicles from there and all of them arrived there and got established. The haste ended. This one was too in the hurry to wait for the other man. This one was too in the hurry to wait for the other man. So they all came to the center and we are established. And we are looking at each other for the next how many minutes. And as I saw, I received instruction. That the absence of order is the abundance of stagnation. I didn't read it from a book. I just saw it at the junction. That anywhere order is lacking, progress is arrested. That if in your personal life, in your personal business, in anything you do, that you, you are lacking in order, it is not possible to be, pos to be, to be, to be, to be, to be pro positive in progress. Wow. I carried pen, I carried paper, I wrote it down in my book. I have preached about it since. One day when Lagos, <laughs> I was going to Canaan land. There was so much hold up on the road. And then we were, were coming as we came close and came close. I would realize that it was just one trailer that parked wrongly. And after that trailer, the road was very clear. And I saw it and I received instruction. And I wrote down, while you are in this journey of life, if where you are now appears congested, just keep moving. The front is free. One day I wrote it in, in Seed of Destiny. The title of that day is The Front is Free. It's not totally congested. The front is free. Am I communicating? It's mental strength. That was the strength of Solomon, David, all these people. Even our master Jesus. He spoke all manner of parables. Using situations he saw. Many people have eyes. They can't see. Ears they have. When I go for a meeting, people who are bigger than me, I look at everything. I can come out of a meeting with 20-something action points based on what I observed. Take your seat in the presence of the Lord. Hallelujah. One day I came to the altar. There was a shoe that I like to wear even though the shoe was smaller than my leg. How many of you know that kind of situation? You like it very well, but... And then at times you force yourself to wear it because of your likeness of it. And then it makes you to walk somehow. You know, when, when the shoe is undersized or oversized, it, it affects your walking step. If it's oversized... And if it is on the size, <laughs> so this was how it was. Kai, and I was going to preach, and I was wearing Agbada. <laughs> Should I pull the shoe now <laughs> to preach barefooted? I am ashamed. <laughs> well, let me try for as long as the shoe will allow me. Open your Bible to the moment I started speaking. I didn't remember where the pain was. 
I preach like somebody from another world. Until I finished preaching, finished praying for the people and it was time to go, then the shoe reminded me. <laughs> it just reminded me that he is still here. It's not that he changed position. The only reason why he left me alone is that I have left focusing on myself and face the people. Take your seat. That the easiest way to escape your pain is to look beyond yourself and to focus. Those are not things you read in a book. You look beyond yourself. Function beyond yourself. Begin, pay attention to the issues of others. Then your own issues will almost escape or disappear or evaporate. And for as long as you keep focusing on others, a time comes when you don't have any issue to deal with. Am I communicating? Are you learning anything at all? Next time you find yourself at a junction or somewhere where there is a lot of roundness, ask yourself, what am I learning here? What am I seeing here? What is this situation saying? I have been to positions where I was too anointed to preach. Yet the equipment could not allow me. Microphone couldn't work. And I didn't need anybody to tell me that assignment without equipment is harassment. That unction turns into frustration if the stage is not set well. So if you want to function at your best, don't play with your tools. These are things, don't play with your tools. That is mental strength. And whatever happens today, I must finish today's own. Let us move from mental strength and go to intellectual strength. When you look at it, intellectual strength is number what now? Alright. When you look at the two of them, you think we are talking about the same thing. No, sir. The, the one we just talked about is wisdom. What we are talking about now is knowledge. Intellectual strength. In Daniel chapter 1, verse 20 to 21. And in all matters of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and the astrologers that were in all his realm. Intellectual strength first means functioning at maximal or maximum intellectual capacity. It is maximizing your brain and magnifying your gain. Maximizing your brain and mag magnifying your gain. Because when the brain is maximized, the gain is magnified. Am I communicating? Do you know that it has been discovered that the best genius in this world, Thomas Edison and all the people who are multi- everything. Most of them didn't use more than 5% of their brain capacity. The brain had more capacity than what they explored. So when they say somebody is at the tail of his class, maybe he's using 0, 1%. 
And yet we can shift beyond those percentages. You use your head to get ahead. Are you following what I'm saying here today? You use your head to get ahead. If you are to be the head and not the tail, you cannot use your tail to be the head. People tail behind the life when the head is not at work. <laughs> you are implicated though. All of you people who are connected, related, and associated with this man too. You are heavily implicated. Because we are not pastoring non-entities. Somebody say amen. amen. One of our girls here got first class from came Oxford University. First class, Oxford. At their rating, maybe second class lower, or even the third class from there, it's possible that he can score first class somewhere else. Somebody say amen. amen. Don't waste your life. When people carry head that is not work, walking, that is weight to the neck. Take your seat. And the weight is much, especially if the head is big. <laughs> Are you following what I'm saying here? Functioning at maximum intellectual capacity. Number two. It is functioning at the cutting edge of your assignment through trainings. Functioning at the cutting edge of your assignment. Summary, it is doing all you can to be the to be at the top in your field. Doing all you can, all you can to be at the top in your field or in your career. Daniel was ten times better. You are not, you are not, you are not, you are not permitted to be at the, at the tail of your class. I was talking with my daughter the other day. I said in our first, in our second year in medical class, that is the second MB class, the, the first major professional exam, we were 120 that wrote the exam and 29 passed. She said, ah, 20. I thought you wanted to say only 29 failed. <laughs> I said, no, 29 passed. Ah. About 30 were withdrawn. Many others had all manner of receipts. I told her, but I never saw, I couldn't imagine myself fail once. Once was too much. And the work to make that happen was put in place. It was not just speaking in tongues. It, the work was put in place. And I had the audacity to pray one prayer one time when I misunderstood the question. Write the autopsy findings of a man dying of liver cirrhosis. Autopsy findings of a man dying. Some of you who are reading law or reading English, that question, how does it sound to you? Autopsy is post-mortem that you do for somebody who has died. 
that's, that is a person has died, so you, you are trying to find the cause of death from head to toe. Now the question says, write the autopsy finding. He has liver disease. I am a man of faith. I believe the man can be healed. <laughs> I also understand the English. The man hasn't died. <laughs> but as far as medical people are concerned, he, the man is dying. Nothing stops the death. He would, do, he would do, deliciously die. And after he has died, you do the autopsy. What will you find? Me, I wrote two lines. That question is over 25. 20, he carried 25 marks. There is no way you could fail it and pass anything else. That one question was over 25. Close my, so I said, well, the man hasn't died of uh, the, the, the liver cirrhosis. What is the need of the autopsy? No need. You cannot do autopsy for somebody who is alive. I wrote, <laughs> wrote two lines. When I got out of the lecture, I realized that uh, that is the normal way the question is framed. And I should have written the autopsy finding. And I didn't write it. There is nothing that could have rescued me. It was a major bangation. <laughs> Banking. But I, I told God, I said, you know I know the answer. The only problem was that I misunderstood the question. The answer that you know that I know, please help me put it down. The, I could pray such a prayer because I knew the answer. I read. There's no way I could have told God, please help me, uh, help me pass. Am I communicating? Take your seat in the presence of the Lord. I haven't finished the story. Before the exam came out, one of the lecturers or one of the people who marked the question saw me at the teaching hospital. I was coming. She said, congratulations. What a performance. What a performance. That guy, it was too much. See, perform what? Amen. I received the congratulation. God put it down himself. By any means, I don't know. But he has a pen. He wrote the, he, he wrote the Ten Commandments. The Bible talks about the pen of a ready writer. Somebody say amen. amen. Take your seat. You owe yourself the duty to ensure that whatever is called your field, you are at the top of the game. You are a lawyer, be the lawyer. You are a doctor, be the doctor. Am I communicating? I once came across a medical doctor who was a guru in terms of ultra, a sonologist, ultrasound scan. He was he could scan anything. And his center was literally the number one center in the land. And I asked him, what happened? He said, oh, he takes himself to America, takes himself all across the world and spend dollars to train himself. That one day he took himself to Asia, to train under one person who has seven different PhDs in ultrasound. Maybe PhD abdominal scan, PhD cardiothoracic scan. Just different PhDs times seven, one person. And he took himself to learn under the person. And he became a star. Let us make it possible, for, easy for God to take us up. When you supply God excellence, he supplies you eminence. If you, if you can release excellence, 
God will guarantee your prominence. That's the glory of the young is your strength and your strength is intellectual. Part of your strength is intellectual strength. That is, you are effortlessly an authority in your realm. Effortlessly an authority in your realm. Finally, on intellectual strength. Intellectual strength is functioning with weighty information content weighty information content that is a man with intellectual strength is informationally loaded informationally loaded he is not bankrupt of light at all Job chapter 36 and in verse 3. I will fetch my knowledge from afar. That is a man who has fetched knowledge. Daniel chapter 9 verse 2. And I, Daniel, understood by books. That is a man who is heavy in books. I heard of a man who was a janitor, a cleaner, and all manner of um, menial jobs he was doing in an office complex. And the man began to read books until he read almost 600 books of different titles. Then that man shifted by the weight of content he, contact, he, he connected from those books. And he became a millionaire. Who bought his own jet helicopter? And one day he flew that jet helicopter across and lowered it to take a look at the place where he was once a cleaner. See, I used to clean down there. See me on top of the skyscraper where I was once a cleaner. If you are not informed, you remain deformed. And if you are not informed, you cannot be transformed. And if you are not informed, you can never perform. Am I communicating? We have a tragedy in our generation. Reading culture is down. Study is down. And I think it is a deliberate attempt to render young people useless. Where you have a lot of people now chatting aimlessly for three hours. How are you? Fine. What is your name? Which one? The first name or the second name? <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I have to keep on saying rubbish things to keep the conversation going. Okay. My name is Joy. But my friends call me Joy Girl. What of you? I'm Jenny. What kind of food do you like to eat? It depends. Aimless talk for the next three hours. Next five hours. Hiya. Block is what they use to build building. Time is what they use to build destiny. And there are so many people breaking their time and demolishing their destiny. What is the stuff of life? That is what is the substance you need to use to, to build your destinies. Being squandered aimlessly. Take your seat. Browsing aimless internet sites. Wasting life. Ben Carson became a brain surgeon at a very young age. 
and became internationally renowned for brain surgery and motivational speaking. His mother told him, Ben, read books, read books, read books. He said, for inside the books, you will see the world. The, your, the books are your eyes to the world. And he really saw the world. And the world saw him. Take your seat. At the time he was in Form 4, he had read like 300 or 400 books already. What you call SS1. And he could answer any question of any, on any subject that the teachers will ask. Any question on any subject. When you are a reader, you are a leader. When you are a learner, you are a leader. Listen. People who have a heavy information they know almost everything about one subject and know something about almost everything. Did you hear what I said? In their field, they know almost everything in that field. And in every other field, they know at least something. I'll be discussing law with my daughter who is reading law talking about land law, we are talking about evidence, we are talking about thoughts, we are talking about jurisprudence, we are talking about contract law. Say, Daddy, how do you know all these things? Wills and codicils and all manner of things. We are talking about different things. And then we, we step into chemistry and step into physics and Newton's laws of universal gravitation and God's laws and just step into accounting and begin to talk of macro and macroeconomics and talk all manner of things. They are wondering. Because in the course of your vast information consumption, you came across one thing or the other that remains permanently there. Somebody say amen. Take your seat in the presence of God. Am I communicating at all? You want to be a Daniel? You don't waste your time. Now, let me give you something very simple and then we shall be going right now. Intellectual. And let me tell you. What you know by yourself is superior to what they taught you in school. There are, there are Things I am functioning in and operating in now that has no, no connection with whatever I learned in school. As a matter of fact, in medical school, they never taught you people management. They never taught you administration. They never taught you. Meanwhile, you are expected to become a medical doctor and to, become, and, and to be in charge of nurses and to, and, to, and to give direction to laboratory scientists and nurses and physiotherapists and nutritionists and give direction to radiographers and all the people and pharmacists and do prescriptions and administer even the finances if you are the chief medical director of the hospital or even the chairman medical advisory committee you are meant to be in an administrative position without learning one course on both finance management or human resource management or nothing like that you are, you are just meant to happen on the the man is a very very dangerous surgeon laser specific surgeon but very Terrible people manager. Practically ran down the hospital. So if you want to do it well and manage people well, what do you do? Learn by yourself. But we're going to have a medical school and it will not be long from now. We will have to be a college of medical sciences. Of probably, I mean, everything medical will be there. Other courses will be there, but everything medical, physiotherapy, Chemist, microbiology, everything will be there. Right? And we are not going to do the normal, regular medical training. It will be, that will be done. But there will also be incorporated into it what, what, what it takes to administer people and what it takes to administer resources. 
and will inject them some divine healing aspect. Oh yes, it will be, it will be injected by the side. So that what injection cannot handle, unction can handle. So that the affliction can check out it by the, by the unction or by the injection or by the combination. Hallelujah. Take your seat in the presence of the Lord. And have a teaching hospital. Where it is possible for the security man to attend to the patient from the gate. And if he impacts him at the gate and the sickness checks out, the man can turn back at the gate and there's no need to. Am I communicating? But I'm saying that because most those things were not taught in school. The things that matter for life, most of the times, you learn it by yourself. You learn them by yourself. One girl told his father, he said, 2x plus 8y equals something, something x. Explain. Number one, am I doing English or mass? <laughs> Alphabets are meant to be with English. Numbers are meant to be with max. Why are they combining the two? Two X plus three Y. <laughs> she asked the father again. Question number two. <laughs> Am I doing math? If it is math, it is one, two, three, four, five. And if it is English, it's A, B, C, D. But why two A plus two, three B? Then <laughs> he said, secondly, this two Y plus two X equals three X now. How will I apply it in practical life? Where will I need it? Ma masters <laughs> applied mathematics, but the things about practical life, you learn them yourself. Please don't be, take your seat, don't be intellectually dull. A lot of young people today are doing passive learning, which does not help the brain. Passive learning is just sitting down and watching a movie from morning till night. It is not helping the brain. A time comes in your life where your memory cells begin to die at the rate of about a thousand cells per day. Yes. But Active information intake creates new memory cells. Am I communicating? Now, passive learning is just, what, is just watching one TV movie or something from morning till night and just seeing things. It doesn't help learning. The most potent form of learning is the active learning which involves reading. When you read materials, you are doing about five, four things. Number one, you are taking letters and converting the letters into words. That tasks the brain. Then, you are taking the words and converting them to sound. When you see B-O-Y, what was that? So you hear the sound boy. Then, you are also then taking the letters that has been converted to words, that has been converted to sound, into vision. When I say B-L-A-C-K, what is that? Black, B-L-A-C-K, what was that? When I say D-O-G, what was that? When I say R-U-N, what was that? Okay. B L A C K D O G R U N N Y I N G. What was that? So what happens? Somehow the picture. You just imagine the picture. All right. That whole process makes your brain very, very act. It's like weightlifting. It makes it makes your brain very sharp, very active. And as long as you sharpen and trim the brain like that continuously, you are brought to the point where you are almost equal to every task. The time 
the, 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 the interval between thinking and responding to things is shortened. You almost respond instantly. When you are asked a question, it's as if you have the answer before the question came. On almost every issue. Somebody asked me a question some time ago. I think he was in China talk, calling me on the phone. And before he could finish <laughs> dropping the phone, I answered him the question. He said, ah, did you prepare that? Did you prepare the answer before I asked? Were you waiting for me to ask, ask the question? Did you know I will ask, ask, ask you this question? I said, no. He said, the way you drop the answer on the spot without thinking, and it is accurate, you have the Spirit of God, and your mind is sharpened. You function like that. Take your seat. Is anybody getting anything at all? Yes. If you read for two hours every day, that is the research I found. I, I found that that's two hours reading a day. You can finish 50 books in a year. 50. Just two hours. You can break, you can break it if you just take like um, one hour in the morning. Sometimes you can set your alarm clock. It doesn't matter whether you read five chapters in, within that one hour. or you, But just, just try and be a bit consistent. And you, it was two hours. And you have finished 50 books in a year. In 10 years, you have 500 books. Anybody who has ever gone through up to 500 books is a, a wicked, dangerous authority in any realm. I mean... That is, you are a mobile inform, info, you, are, you are mobile information. You are a powerhouse of impact. Almost everything you say will be dropping like bomb. Somebody got something today. If you say two hours was too much for you, maybe you can try one hour. That's 25 books in a year. And that 25 books will make you 250 books in 10 years. That is far ahead of 95, almost 95% 95 of the people that you ever, ever know. Far ahead. Somebody say amen. amen. Are you tired? Are you enjoying yourself as much as I'm enjoying myself? So shutting down reduce possibly delete your aimless internet time aimless your, people are buying data buying data for aimless things so we have done what was the first strength we dealt with spiritual strength and the second one physical strength and the third one emotional strength and the fourth one and the fifth one Number six is financial strength. Monitious strength. Very important. You are not too young to be a billionaire. Mike Zuckerberg is in your age group. And he started from a very, very young age. What I, I'm just talking about now. He's making money out of, out of people wasting their lives. <laughs> That's what I just talk about now. Movie stars are millionaires. But I don't know whether they watch the movies themselves. Financial strength. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 15. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 15. He said, The rich man's wealth is his strong city. Proverbs 18, 11 said so. But the destruction of the poor is their poverty. The rich man's wealth is his strong city. And permanently the destruction of the poor remains their poverty. Poverty is a calamity. Poverty he has almost the same rank with the devil. Because the thief cometh not but for to steal, to kill, and to destroy. And the destruction of the poor is their poverty. A plus B 
equals B plus C. All right, okay. A equals B and B equals C. What is the meaning of that? A is directly equals C. If, the, the, if Satan, the devil, is a destroyer and poverty is a destroyer, then poverty is a Satan. <laughs> Take your seat. Huh? If the devil is a destroyer, poverty is a destroyer, then poverty is a devil. How many young people could not fulfill their vision in life because father died and they could no longer go to school? How many people died because they couldn't afford a hospital bill of a sickness that was purely curable? Am I communicating? If somebody had enough money to buy a car, he wouldn't have entered the ritual killer's car. He would drive himself. He would drive himself. But he entered 419 car. And then the 419, but you will never be at that level. Take your seat. Poverty, poverty by cow. Poverty, 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 co? My cow. Watch the cow. It's not good at all. Poverty. Say it in your language, it's not good. Talk where we are. Oh, you know. Oh, you, oh, you, fruit from. Oh, you, 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 Poverty is not a confirmation of humility. And it's not a proof of integrity. But I don't want to cheat. I don't want to be corrupt. I don't want to be bright to be. I don't want to bribery and corruption. That is why I'm poor. It's a lie from the pit of hell. Job had the highest integrity in his generation. He had the highest integrity, and he was also the richest man in his days. Riches is combinable with righteousness. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And integrity is combinable with prosperity. Take your seat. Make up your mind. You make up your mind that what the way you grew up, nobody near you will grow up like that. You make up your mind that where your father stopped, you will exceed it. Yes. Financial strength. Take your seat. Masha Koko Balaba. What is financial strength all about? I didn't know I would reach up to this time here. Financial strength is existence in the realm of financial authority. Financial authority where money do, does your biddings. You command and you are obeyed by money. Existence in the realm of financial authority. Secondly, it is existence in the realm of financial understanding. You know how money works. You make money work for you. You don't just work and struggle for money. Money works for you. Robert Kiyosaki wrote a book titled um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Very great book. Am I communicating at all? We are at a very, very young age. 
you are in financial rest. No trace of stress, no trace of tension. And you step there. Yeah. Let me go on because I, I, it's not on money we are dealing with essentially. So take your seat. Financial understanding makes you know that money is not for expenditure. Money is for investment. Financial understanding makes you to understand that money is not to be used to acquire liabilities. Money is to be used to secure assets. Summary is financial understanding makes you to know that the purpose of money is to use money to bring more money. That's the summary. When people who have a poverty mentality see money, they look for what to buy. And when people who have a financial authority mentality see money, they look for how to turn that one naira to two naira. Am I communicating? Give you an example. We had a girl who was working as a cleaner in our church. One day, I saw a young man with her and she was doing some money things with her. So I said to her, who is that? She said, he works for me. That's for her. Cleaner. The person is working for her. She's cleaning. So I said to her, what work does she do? So I buy, I, I buy recharge cards. He sells them for me. And I give him commission out of it. She's a cleaner. Using her salary and any other source of income to buy recharge cards. And somebody is trading for her. The money is multiplying. She has escaped that realm of cleaner since. Some people, when they get money, it is to buy a new shoe. A new shirt new hairstyle, change my phone to iPhone 1 million. <laughs> that is a poverty mentality. When you see a man drive a car that is 5 million, a, a man with prosperity mentality, he has a minimum of 10 times that amount cash somewhere minimum that is a part that is that is liquid straight and other things like house and other things when you see a poor man get 5.5 million he uses 5 million to buy a car and use 500 to try to fuel it until he has no fuel money anymore that is a poor man that money just misrode into his hand. Take your seat. Are you learning anything at all? Yeah. This, this lecture is too loaded though. Yeah. I went to dedicate the housing estate of a man. Big estate, story building, plenty. In this, in Nabuja here. And I asked him, I said, where do you, so where's your own house? The normal Nigerian people's behavior. I thought he would say, um, I have a house. Uh, my own, my two places at Meitama or Sokoro, some of these places where uh, the house is uh, half a billion in worth. He said, oh no, I'm living in a two-bedroom flat in Karu. That is a man whose estate I just dedicated. I say, hey, your house. He say, no, it's a rented house. He pays one twenty thousand. That it is easier for him that way. Uncle. 
It's easier for him. He said, you know, that the rent he pays there is easier for him to pay that 120 than to go and look for your house in Metama or somewhere, something, something, something that, he, that the balance of his money is still using it to multiply. That is the difference. That is the difference. I heard of a girl who had one million dollars. One, how much? Young lady, not married yet. One million dollars. One million dollars is what? Three hundred. Who was still entering taxi? Not in Nigeria, though. <laughs> He's entering taxi where? Because for, for here, if you have a little money, maybe you should own your, a cheap car. Not too much of a car. Because he needed the balance of the money to still be multiplying the money. We want to be big men too fast. I want to show off too much. You got a contract, two, thousand, two million naira. And then out of the two million naira, you now went and bought a car of one million, nine hundred thousand. Use that money to, to, register, to register the car and then begin to look for how to fuel the car. The car has now become a, a, a liability. You don't have an asset. You are, you are now looking for money to service the car and then struggling to show off. No, sir. No. You should come to a point where you have millions and nobody is aware yet. Somebody's life already changed. Even if you don't tell me, I know somebody's life is already changed. Who is that person? Take your seat. Did you hear what I just said? You have millions and nobody is aware yet. You are under radar. Then suddenly you, you came out small. You bought one small car. Then you came out small. That is financial understanding. Don't forget. Money's purpose is not expenditure. It is investment. If you go to any man's house and he has three girls in his house or four girls. Okay, five, let me say three girls. Girl number one, his wife. Girl number two, his, 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 his daughter. And girl number three, another daughter. Or maybe he's a niece that grew up with him. And the person say, I want to. All these people are fine looking. I'd like to marry one of them if you will agree. The first person he wants to marry out is his wife, right? Huh? That's right. Nobody marries out his wife. I mean, even in your dream. The wife is not to be married out. No, no, no. Wife is not. Wife is yours. Wife will give birth to who can be married out. That is something I call mother money and daughter money. Take your seat. I'm sorry to use that illustration, but the, the main money, the main capital is not what you spend from. That one multiplies the one you can spend from. Am I communicating? Over communication. Sir. Over communication is worrying this message. <laughs> Over communication is worrying this message. Hallelujah. That, this is what I mean. Take your seat. How he got such a land in a good place in Abuja here. Three million only. Under eight weeks. 
Somebody came and bought the land that he sold the car to buy for 3 million, for 30 million. He said, sir, what you told me walked on. He said, I can't believe this. He said, I, I, I took three million, bought this. He said, I wasn't even expecting to sell it until somebody came under pressure. That is times ten. He was driving 30 million without knowing. your seat. Your life is already changed. Your life is already changed. Delay. I'm looking for some young girls here who will be millionaires before 30. Before the age of 30. I'm looking for uh, some young men here who will be billionaires before you are 35. If you are among them, you say louder, Amen. You will say loud, amen. You will say the loud most, amen. When you see your aimless friend with little money, bragging with uh, discussion, eh? end of discussion. Discussion continue. Discussion interrupted. Just leave him. Tell him, just be shining with nothing. I am coming. Hey! Hey! Just be shining with nothing. Be shi Just go ahead. Go ahead and be shining with nothing. I am coming. By the time I come, I can buy 10 of those cars on the spot. Take your seat. All right, I, I see that you are on fire. Stand on your feet and scream, hey! Help me shake the hands of seven people around you and tell them, everything just changed in my life. Everything just changed. Everything just changed. Everything just changed. Give the Lord a shout of praise. I see a new generation of millionaires, a new generation of billionaires emerging out of here. Shout, Yes, Lord. Take your seat. Maybe one of the days we'll just focus on financial matters. Hallelujah. Finally, financial strength is existence as a generational asset not a generational liability. You are not existing beggarly. You are not existing beggarly. You are not existing and looking pitiable. You are not looking for who to borrow money from. Not borrow spoot, borrow shine. No. You hate the beggarly life. You hate the pitiable life. It. That is financial strength. You prefer to do laborers work than to ask people for money. And you, you refuse to remain a baby forever. The time comes when you say, no, my father and my mother cannot continue to spend money on me. You know what? One of the things that sh shocked my head, my father I learned so many things from my father. My father was 
18 years old when he started raw business and was, he said he was carrying things on his head for long distances until he, he literally developed bald head from carrying things on his head but he was very rugged at the age of 18 and had so much money when we were small children brand new Mercedes car brand new lorries you are, you are witness. Brand new luxury buses everywhere. <laughs> At those, in those days, some people say they would stand on the road and be counting the buses and be counting the lorries. Some children, see this one? you saw them too. You counted too. <laughs> you know? But one of the things, it, they, it, it teaches us very brutal. That is you. You have to learn at times not by direct instruction. He can tell you something like, I don't know my father. My father died when I was a small boy, like five years or 13 years or something. I don't know my father. And then he will say something like, you, you know your father. Something like, so what will you become? Do you understand? <laughs> now, I'm paraphrasing now. It's like, I don't know my father. Uh, and I have arrived at where I am now in life. You that know your father, what, well, what will you become? That kind of a thing. Then he will say something like, when you are approaching the age of 18, he said, I started business at 18. I was age 18 when I started business. You are still hanging around here. Very, very raw and very brutal. Now, those kind of things make young people to get very angry. What do you want me to do now? Shouldn't I go through to school? Should I leave school and start business? <laughs> that, that kind of thing. But for me, it injected fire into my brain. Fire into my brain. I made up my mind that if my father had any inheritance for, for sharing, I don't need one naira out of it. A, any other person can divide it, not me. I am too big to be part of sharing anything. That is, I had nothing. I was just starting as a young man. I made up my mind that I wouldn't need a pin. I wouldn't need a pin to be settled or to be set up. You know, I made up my mind aggressed that, I mean, what the, I wasn't planning to be a pastor, so that was out of the question. In my medical career, in everything I was going to, I mean, I was going to have money, plenty of it. It was a decision. I, I won't steal, I won't beg, but I will have the money, plenty of it. You see? And by the time you follow the principles, the principalities can't stop you. Are you following what I'm saying here today? They can't stop you. See, me, your decision, your decision backed up with your consecration guarantees your destination. No, the, the devil can do nothing about it. Take your seat. So this is very, very important. You need financial strength. How many of you know that financial strength makes you to walk with some level of boldness? There's something they call the confidence strides of a successful man. Confidence strides. You don't walk, you don't feel inferior to nobody under heaven. And you don't do things with money considerations. Because money is at the back of the question. There is no way they will invite me to preach worldwide and I'll be thinking how much would they give me. There are places I have got. I went to preach in London the other time. And maybe about three or four weeks later, the bishop of that place called me to find out whether they have sent me honorarium. I said, I'm not aware. Let me find out. I paid my airfare going, paid my airfare coming, didn't ask for a dime. Oh, have they given any other? Oh, I'm not aware. I didn't return back thinking, how much is your I, If he didn't call me, I will remember till kingdom come. That I went somewhere and, and they didn't give me any envelope. It's not part of the equation. That's not why I'm preaching. The one who called me will pay me. <laughs> Am I communicating at all? So it's very, very important. It gives you, it makes you decide to do things or not to do them, not with no money consideration. It makes you to be on your feet. You, you, you don't look, you don't look down on yourself, and nobody is permitted to look down on you. You won't allow them. Hallelujah. Finally, number seven. Is moral strength. 
or call it character strength. I put it last because the, the, the best is always kept for the last. Daniel chapter 1 verse 8. The Bible said, but Daniel proposed in his heart that he will not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. The Lord bless his word in Jesus name. What is, what is moral strength? Number one, it is the capacity to take a stand for the right thing. Even if it means standing alone. The capacity to take a stand for the right thing. Even if it means standing alone. There are many people today who are too concerned about who, who is agreeing with what they think is right. There are too many people today who follow the multitude to do evil. There are too many people today who are addicted to approval. If my skirt is too long, what would they think of me? If my gown is too, is too big, what would they think? If uh, uh, I wake up every morning and I pray, what do people think? It doesn't, it doesn't, you have come to the point where what people think matters no more. Don't forget this. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel took a stand where it appeared like they were alone in their stand. Taking a stand. You are not afraid to be a lone ranger. You are not afraid to be the only one of your conviction, provided that conviction is godly. There are people who are not strong at all. It is the capacity to say no to wrong without apology. Even if the multitude is saying yes, you say no to wrong without apologizing. Oh, I'm so sorry, but you know I cannot drink alcohol. I'm sorry for hurting you. Hurting who? You say no to wrong and you don't feel any remorse or any apology. The wrong is wrong. You won't apologize for, for saying no. Anybody can think you are antisocial. That is all right. Character. Moral strength. Strength of character. One man that I respected, big man. I met him something. I think I was doing a retreat in one uh, with my family or so. We came across each other at the Hilton. And so he, he had a discussion to have with me. Can we go here and, and sit by this place? And that was the pool bar area where you see the swimming pool and the naked people, half naked, trying to swim and so on. <laughs> I, said, I look at my I said, me, I should follow you to go here, sit down here. And discuss here. Say what happened. My brain colorized. I craze. Craze catch me. What will I? What will I say? I say I'm now. This man may be ten years older than me. And this man may be. I've been hearing of him. I don't know what was his motive for such a suggestion. But it was refused without apology. Say no to wrong without apology. Papa said he invited somebody to preach in, his, in their church one day and the person was trying to call for certain kind of offering. Uh, if you can give this... From where he sat down, he said, shh. In other words, don't do that here. The man looked back and said, and at the end of the service, he, he told the man, he said, look, we don't function like that here. And if, if you step on anybody's altar, 
before you carry out any other duty apart from preaching, ask him what to do. Then you will be guided. That's audacious. In the process, you may lose friends. But it is better you lost people than to lose principles. People are very, very good, and I don't underplay that. But if a person left you because you are upholding a principle, it's all right. It is the capacity to say no to wrong without apology. Number three is the capacity to put your passion and actions under control. Moral strength. Capacity to put your passions and actions under control. You are in courtship, you have not married yet. There are things your passion will want you to do. If we are going to be married and we are going to do this eventually, why don't, why don't we do it now? And the moral character, moral strength and character strength say no. 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 Until we have official license. Because until you can control your flesh, you have no control over your future. When a man's life is out of control, his destiny is out of control. See a person with uncontrollable temper, uncontrollable appetite, eats without control. It mingles with women and men. Control. I've once met a girl who said she, she does not, she couldn't know how to say no to a man. Hey, that is like a bitch, a dog let loose. What, what a wastage of life. That strength. Tell you, tell everything, no, not now. When you delay your gratification, you maximize your satisfaction. Capacity. Number four, right? Number four. Moral or character strength is the capacity to place pleasure to God above pleasure to anybody. That is, the capacity to place pleasure to God above pleasure to anybody. That is, what is of most interest to you is how to please God above how to please a person. That is, if God is pleased and people are displeased, it's all right. That is, the only person you fear not to annoy is God. But there are people who will rather please men than God. That is, if God is angry, it doesn't matter, but that man mustn't be angry with them. That girl must not be angry with them. No. Moral strength. Character strength says, I rather please God than man. Am I communicating? Finally, moral or character strength is the capacity to publicly represent God without being ashamed or being concerned about people's opinions. The capacity to publicly represent God without being ashamed or being concerned about people's opinions. That is, I belong to God. I am a child of God. I am born again. I am filled with the Holy Ghost. And it doesn't matter what anybody feels. In your class, you are known with God. In your family, you are known with God. 
in your community, you are known with God. Elijah, well known. Daniel, you have notorious spirituality. What did I say? You have notorious spirituality. You are notoriously spiritual. You know how a notorious criminal is a popular, well known criminal? That's how you are spiritually. Not a criminal now, but a notoriously spiritual. Nobody can claim ignorance of their knowledge of, of you and God. Nobody can claim that they don't know that you are publicly identified with God. That is moral strength. There are Christians who hide their Bible. They speak in tongues, but nobody must know. In the class, nobody must know. You know so that they don't pick on him and then when they, are, when they are castigating churches and pastors, they don't point at him. That is weakness of character. But strength says, here, here am I. I belong to God. Whatever you want to say, say it now. It's a new day. Did you receive something? Is your life changed? Are you going to experience the glory of the young? Stand up on your feet where you are.